Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. It's another week of more tunes and more people to talk to. Tonight we have Kurt Feldman. We all know him from the Depreciation Guild. Some of you may know him from the pains of being pure at heart. Some of you, if you are that hipster indie type, <laughs> if you're really that into obscure stuff, you know, we've got Ice Choir and Romana Clef. So, yeah, let's start things off first with playing us by playing a song oh yeah since they're new people just remember to keep your microphones on mute um, mm -hmm. unless you want to say something or ask something this isn't like a formal interview you guys can say or ask whatever you want if you want to ask what what Kurt had for breakfast be my guest you know so that's it basically just keep your microphones on mute if you guys don't keep it on mute and you are feedbacking like crazy, I will put a mute on you and you'll have to ask me to unmute you. So yeah, that's it for the house rules. So to kick oh. things off, we could listen to a track first from the Depreciation Guild, which is Sky Ghosts, something which I personally like. It's a really fun song. Um, yeah, and we can talk later uh, about it and more stuff, so yeah. We'll get a drink or something, you know. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Although this is coffee. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Me too. Yeah.
guys hear Woo. those claps? <laughs> yes, that was Woo. great. <laughs> so that was from uh, In Her Gentle Jaws uh, back in 2007. Um, from what I remember, it was initially released as a free download, right? Yeah. Uh, was it like um, um, that? Was that your plan initially, or was it because of what's going on during at the time? You know, where I don't know. Maybe it was it was about like music piracy, and you know, you just figured out. You know what? Well, let let's just put it on on our yeah, website for yeah. free. Uh, yeah. I mean, there. That's that's sort of yeah. That did have something to do with it. I mean, we. Uh, were like a relatively new band at the time, or I mean, we had been around for maybe a year or so, but uh, <clears throat> you know, at, at the time, really nobody had any idea who we were. So like, it just seemed kind of futile to like try to re- make a record and sell it because mm-hmm. nobody had really any reason to. Um, and we had, I think, you know, at the time, like we had just started with a manager. Um, who that like that was like his 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 idea was to just be like you know uh don't try to sell this record it's great but like you know uh <laughs> like you know it basically uh, the other thing that really inspired it was like at the time in rainbows had just come out and radiohead mm. had like sort of uh, had, yeah. had they were the first band i remember that like kind of like demonstrated that model and mm-hmm. it worked for them mm-hmm. because people did actually like buy the physical version and that uh-huh. was sort of like a, like a stretch goal of that, like mm. like maybe we'll get enough donations from uh-huh. uh, from people to um, you know like fund like pressing it ourselves or like maybe uh-huh. like a label will be interested in it. And that actually did happen, like K-9 two years records, later. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah it happened. Records, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I think we we ended up releasing it as like a, a real album, mm-hmm. like a couple of years later. But it mm-hmm. did that did sort of come from like. The bu- well, we, look. I mean, we got we got pretty lucky with that. Uh, there was, um, I think, like I would say, ninety nine percent of the reason why like anyone even heard about that record mm-hmm. was because uh, I th- I'm pretty sure my friend Pete Berkman was the one who posted it on uh, something awful. If you guys remember that forum, something awful, yeah. All right. And there was just some like free for all music thread that he posted it on. It was like, hey, my friend put out a free record, check it out. <laughs> and like, um, we it got like a hundred thousand downloads in one weekend or something like that because <laughs> wow, it was free. So, uh-huh, yeah. so that really did. That was like the only reason why anyone ever heard of this band. Um, <laughs> and I think it's pretty cool. I'm talking to, you know. Uh, a bunch of people I don't know from the Philippines, uh, a place we never played because we released a free album in 2007. Uh, um, so, but yeah, that, that's pretty much the story of that. Uh, that's amazing. All right, that's cool. Yeah. Um, how about the beginnings, I guess, of Depreci- Depreciation Guild? Um, how how that come about? Um, were you guys friends from way back? I know a couple of them... Yeah. Uh, you also played with uh, the Pains later on, I think, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I started the band um, with my friend Adrian, who like was my best friend from high school, mm-hmm. and um, so yeah, we grew up. You know, well, he yeah, I mean, we were we were friends basically since high school, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, we we were in a band in high school. It was terrible, and <laughs> then, you don't have anything uh, online, no, do you? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> horrible band. Um, but yeah, that so like we when we were both in in college, like towards the end, like I started writing those songs, like I guess like maybe towards the beginning of college, um, you know. And he we didn't go to the same school, but he was in New York, um, like at the same time, and we, and we you know started just working. I, I had a, a collection of like a few songs, and I was like, hey, would you want to do this? This would be an interesting thing. Um, like it was it was funny because actually like in my band in high school we started like incorporating nintendo elements into it um in like sort of a different way that was that was like way worse and then um uh i started a band like more centered around that concept Mm -hmm. um and that was with adrian and we yeah we just started like playing together and uh eventually we started doing some shows and then we had like enough songs for an album that we recorded with our friend that was like uh 
that was like basically the start. Like that that album was like, you know, <laughs> this is. I mean, I hear like shoegaze records now, um, mm. and they just sound so much better than that album. Like no, none of us had any idea what we were doing. It was just like. <laughs> Uh, like Wait. the software we used for everything was just hilarious. Uh, like, it was right. Terrible. Uh, um, I got one more question actually, yeah. um, and I want to make, and I also want to just get this out of the way because I'm not sure if this is you. Where did you play at a uh, with a band called the Alps? I did. Yeah. Wow. Oh my god, you I, did, yeah. Because I have this um, CD. That's oh Stam my god, yeah. That I'm collecting for beginners, uh, released by Secret Crush. Okay, so was, the guy, yeah. the guy that ran that label is. Uh -huh. I found this Greg. out way later. Uh, wait, do you know his name? I can't remember. Something Greg. Weiss. Greg, Greg Weiss. Greg Weiss. Yeah. Okay, so his mom was my math teacher in, <laughs> like, uh, tenth grade. I think mm -hmm. um and like somehow that like i came to know that and it blew my mind because i was like wait uh, this guy okay yeah anyway that's that was uh just a funny funny tip cool. but yeah i i didn't actually play on the recording for that uh -huh. um uh. that was like i was like brought in for that band like as a fill-in um and uh i eventually joined the band like kind of full-time but under Mm -hmm. more unfortunate circumstances oh, like the guy okay. who i was temporarily replacing um had stomach cancer and he died from that Ooh, and he oh was like gosh. the whole plan right. was like Ooh. so we were playing we were like playing as as like a trio and then he was he was like we were kind of like playing with i was i started playing bass and like he switched over guitar that was like his main instrument and we were like practicing with him like kind of hoping he would uh recover and and, and yeah Unfortunately, it was, it was just like really super sad. But um, yeah, that that band was really cool. A bunch of like friends from I met like while I was in college. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I can't believe you found that and you know that I yeah. was in that band. Um, yeah, uh, Dale knows uh, all the time. He has a big <laughs> library of obscure yeah. <laughs> CDs and records. Me and uh, me and my brother had a band too, which is in this CD as well. So it was like I was like looking at it and was like, wait, which is one? This um apple orchard track 17 it was okay. like a we were just doing you know four track recordings during at the time and then greg reached out to us i think this is during you know those those, those uh myspace days totally he was yeah. like hey uh you know we're making a compilation can i include one of your songs I'm like yeah cool sure of course because we were just you know like ex well not really experimenting but you know just making music on a four track <laughs> i remember that compilation being really solid. I haven't listened to it in so long. I like got rid of all my CDs a few years ago, but um, I do remember there was a, a track on there that like Kip from the Pains and I both loved and we would like put it on her every once in a while. It was yeah. like on heavy rotation. That song, it was like uh, Grape Storms is the band, I think. Are they on there? Uh, yes, track number three, Grape Storms. Let's Only see. for myself or something. Uh -huh. That one uh, for myself, that's, yes. That's yeah, one. yeah. Check that song out if you if you guys get a chance. Right. Probably on YouTube somewhere. I think it, it, it is on um, Spotify. I believe. I think. Oh wow! I think okay. it is. Yeah. To me, that is just like an insanely obscure CD that I can't believe somebody <laughs> else has. <laughs> so that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> you must you must have like an insane collection. I can see it and, kind of behind uh, you a little bit. Not really. I mean, compared to some people I know, it's it's really not as uh, as good as the, uh, some people I I do know and I've seen some of their collections. That, uh, so I'm I'm keeping mine really more, I guess, streamlined nowadays. You know, just picking up the stuff that I really really love. You know. So anyway. <laughs> but to be I'm fair, gonna, I'm gonna. To be fair, Dale is like the resident archivist of the Philippine <laughs> shoegaze scene. So. <laughs> Wait, Dale, what's the Apple Orchard song? What's the title? Oh. I'm just going to put it in a, in a new oh tab. Oh, my so gosh. It, it's embarrassing because I don't like the song anymore. It's like, uh, it's Summer's Near, and it's just hey, so low. I don't like any of the Depreciation Guild stuff for the record, so <laughs> you guys just forced me to listen to that in front of uh, 25 strangers. So. Yeah. You owe all me right, this. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> cool. So going right. back to the... To the beginnings or like to how depreciation guilds started out you started out in new york how was that i mean like what was the scene like when you were starting out was it kind of 
were you more of like an internet band when you started out or were you kind of playing shows around the city um, when you you know when you started out how how did it all go about and how did you I guess start touring and stuff yeah right uh, so I mean when we started it was uh, 2005 like <laughs> being an internet band I don't think was really even a thing then okay. like there was there was MySpace music which was like mm -hmm. a way for people to hear your music and that was like an interesting new concept if you can imagine that but um because <clears throat> like people kind of knew if they wanted to hear a band you could just oh yeah look them up on myspace or whatever like fi like listen to a few songs or something um so like that was uh, that was like the first time i think that was really possible but like as far as like being an internet band like having buzz and stuff like we were never that band um uh, mm -hmm. the rec when the record first record came out like it was there was like a, a short time where, you know, like, you know, blogs and stuff were like writing about it and, um, you know, people were just stumbling upon it through like various websites and whatever, but we were never really like a internet band. Um, I'm trying to remember like the scene at the time, you know, 2005 was like in New York. Uh, it was like a lot of like, kind of like dancey kind of like indie rock stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> that band Alps was a uh, sort of a main offender in that aspect. aspect. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think there was like, I don't think there were a lot of like bands at that time doing like, as like more, like more like directly, like kind of like shoegaze stuff. Um, there was like a little bit of a scene uh, there. Like I can remember there was like some other, there was this band like sound pool at the time, like mahogany oh, was making yeah. stuff. Yeah. Mad in New York. yeah. Um, I'm trying to like think of there's other ones. Um, but that, that like, wasn't really the stuff that was like really like influencing me necessarily. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really ever even like played with a lot of those bands. Actually, like we were, there was, a, there was a more thriving chiptune scene in New York at that time than there was like a shoegaze scene. Like there was, mm -hmm. there was a, this venue called the tank, which would have these like, um, chiptune shows. And we played those. They were a fucking mm -hmm. mess like, every time, <laughs> but they were really fun. Um, so we would play with like chiptune groups. Sometimes it was like blip festival was like the big, like New York mm -hmm. chiptune festival that we, that was, those were like the biggest shows we were playing for like the mm -hmm. first, like three or four years of the band or whatever, or three, uh, two or three years, I would say. Um, so yeah, that was like, that was like more of the, more of the scene. And then like shoegaze started getting like, I don't know, becoming more of like a thing, I guess, like l l shortly after that. Um, and then like, actually the way that, um, I sort of became the drummer for the pains mm -hmm. was through, <laughs> uh, like, so our manager when, uh, you know, who started working with us this like basically right before the album was was released like <clears throat> he said hey i work with these guys um they're really cool and they actually have a band like two of his co-workers were <laughs> uh kip and alex the bass player mm -hmm. um and uh he said like they have this really cool band that just started out called the pains me pure at heart it would be great to do like a show with them mm -hmm. and so the first like the first time i ever met those guys was like was like playing a show with the pains basically um and uh yeah that was uh i don't even remember when that was like 2007 or something i actually i i i had heard of them before that he he had mentioned their band before well we anyway we we still we played a show in like 2000 like i don't know like 2007 or something or like whatever it was um and that's that's kind of like how i met those guys and then i sort of got more introduced to like uh, like the indie pop scene that was like happening at like venues mm -hmm. like cake shop and whatever there's you know a couple other yeah. ones um but yeah I, I think there was like there's always been like a pretty strong like indie pop scene and in, in new, new york, york too. yeah and i i didn't really know about a lot of that stuff until like i don't know probably like 2006 or 2007 um but that was uh yeah that's i don't know uh, I'm kind of rambling. Do you guys have any no, specific? No, no, no. We, we get it. Yeah, yeah. It's um, interesting. Yeah, it's just interesting, I you know. Remember in New York, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just interesting ahead, with the ahead, whole yeah. chip tune thing. It, it's I, yeah. I, that's one of the first things I I noticed the first time I heard music of the Depreciation Guild. You know, I was like, 
this sounds a lot like Nintendo. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone yeah. was like, it's a super shoegaze band, and when I heard it, I was like, yeah, there's like kind of some elements of it, but it's mostly this cool electronic sort of thing. So what was your influence behind the chip, the whole chip tune thing, and putting it into your music with with the Depreciation Guild? Like, were you like into I don't know Japanese sort of Whoa. stuff, or I mean. Were you, were you yeah. a gamer? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I was and still am. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, um, I yeah, so like, uh, I was into some Japanese stuff like at that time. Um, I would say like the thing that influenced me to get into like chiptune stuff was like in high school. There was this website. It was very far ahead of its time. I don't know if anyone remembers it, but it was called Micro Music. And it had like this kind of flash interface where you could just sort of like s- scroll through this like like flash pop up kind of thing of like a game system and it would like play these little animations. But then also it would, you'd be playing through these like different artists that were just like featured on their site. Mm-hmm. And I would just like flip through there and just like hear this insanely cool chip music stuff. It wasn't all like directly chiptune stuff, but the stuff that was chiptune was like really well curated. And I remember hearing this song by this guy named Hallie, who I met later on um, in like 2006 at Blipfest. But that, this song called like Paragon 5 Rock, which was made on a Game Boy, completely like blew my mind. And I was like, how is this possible? I want to learn how to do this. Uh-huh. So I was just like searching around on the internet and there were like kind of like a few different ways into like making shit music. And at, at the time it was not easy to get a hold of this hardware that you needed to do the Game Boy stuff. It was just completely out of print at that time. Like there was no, they weren't producing any of the cartridges. So I was like, all right, well, it would be cool to have a Game Boy thing I could write, write these songs on, but um, it wasn't really possible at the time. So I discovered this like, like in this like horrible app called Nerd Tracker 2. And I never had made, like I play guitar. So like, I, I don't really know um, anything really about like, especially at the time, like electronic music or like how to go about doing any of that stuff. Um, so I kind of just like, it's just through reading the manual. I mean, YouTube didn't even exist at this time. So it's just like had to read this like confusing manual and like learn how to use a tracker, which is like proto. It's like before MIDI software. It's like just like kind of like typing in notes and stuff. And I like taught myself how to do that. Just like you know as like a hobby kind of and started writing songs on that um i started just like try, like trying to do covers of of like other stuff whatever just like trying to figure out how to like make the sounds shape the sounds in a way that like you know made it sound like a song and like that's basically like how i started um like getting into that whole like chip music thing um what was like? What was your original question, even? No, I, I can't even remember. It was just like you know, <laughs> this is what happened. It's here. all right. Just, I mean, you know, it's all right. <laughs> but yeah, for, I mean, yeah, we were, oh, you were asking. You were asking how I got into that. Like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was so that, yeah. I guess, that website, <laughs> Micro Music, to answer your question. And I started. I, I just figured out how how to kind of like create that stuff through like very ar- archaic, like unfinished software that was like. Uh, it was a total mess. I used to crash all the time. I would lose all my work and just like insane shit. It was terrible. <laughs> Did that experience, I guess, help you with you know with doing music for say I Squire or? <laughs> I was, yeah, I wanna, once I started like working on a <clears throat> on like a like a real doll like Pro Tools and just <laughs> it's like oh it saves your work for you. This is way better. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't just lose five hours of work because it crashed. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah, man, yeah, that was a lot, a lot better. And it's like it's way more intuitive because you're just like looking at uh, notes, like kind of on a MIDI roll. So, mm-hmm. it, yeah, it was easy to switch to that once mm-hmm. I was doing tracking because that's just insanely, needlessly complicated. complicated. I mean, people still, yeah, like, I can people still make music that way, but I, I, it's not, Ugh. it's not something I like really. Uh, <laughs> want to go back to ever? <laughs> you can see the general differ- generational difference right now because I've never had to <laughs> go through that. <laughs> I've worked with a doll all my life, so <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure everyone else here has worked with a doll all their life, <laughs> save for a couple of people. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Even before that, there was like MIDI DAWs. Like you could do like you know like early versions of like uh, Steinberg and like whatever Cubase like could function in the same way as a DAW, but you weren't really recording audio. You were kind of just <laughs> manipulating MIDI in a sequencer kind of way, which also is more visual and makes way more sense. But at the time, like I mean, now the other thing is now like if I wanted to do like Nintendo stuff, like there's 400 VSTs that you could get for free probably that could perfectly replicate the sound and do more and make your life so much easier. And like, there's absolutely no need to go back and do that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So one last thing before, if, un unless anyone else has a question. So what was kind of, mm -hmm. cause, cause the depreciation guild isn't like, it doesn't sound to me as like a purely chip tune thing. Like how did the whole, yeah. I guess, alternative indie rock influence get in that sound? Yeah, I mean, that was just, like, the other style of, of stuff that was, like, really inspiring me um, uh, at, at, yeah, at the time, you know. And I was like, well, it would be really cool to do something that, like, was just all the stuff I like listening to, you know. That was that was really, it wasn't any more uh, complicated than that, really. Mm -hmm. So, um... um um, name drop some bands that you were listening to that you sort of like um, influence okay. or inspired depreciation guild. Yeah, for that band, for sure. Like, um, I mean, Cocteau Twins was like always. That's always been yeah. pretty much my yeah. favorite band. Um, you know, My Bloody Valentine, all the mm -hmm. all the, the, the obvious ones. Like Pale Saints was always like a huge band for me. Um, yeah. I love them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the Wake was like another really big one. The Wake, yes. Very inspiring. Teaser, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I met that guy in, in uh, Glasgow. Um, very cool. Uh, yeah, I, I got to see The Wake play the New York City Pop Fest back in maybe 2012, maybe? I'm not entirely sure. But they did play the New York City Pop Fest, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. No, they're great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love all those guys. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, th that's like yeah. that's like a handful of of. Uh, I mean, there was uh, obviously other ones, of, you know, but those those were the main ones. I I think like when I think back now and like, what are, what are the bands that like I, I really mm -hmm. still love listening to? Like that's the oh Curve too, another one probably. Curve, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So um, right. does anyone else want to say or ask something before we move on to a another? Project of the next song. Hmm. No one? Five, four. Well, I, I, I have a question real quick. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. Oh, hi. So, how, how did you meet up with, like, the Hawkeye twins? Because, like, I kind of have, like, met them through, like, shows and stuff in LA and, like, through Able Body. And I was okay, just kind yeah. of curious, like, did you, did you, like, was it through, like, the pains or did they join after uh, Depreciation Guild? Yeah, so like the the order of events was like I started the band with my friend Adrian, and that was like in New York in like two thousand five, whatever. And uh, uh, at the same time, I was like in NYU, and so was Christoph and Anton. And uh, like tour, like right after we released the first record, Adrian uh, went to grad school, uh, so like he wasn't really able to do the band anymore. And um, I asked. Christoph, who I like just knew through friends. Um, he so like the guy who engineered the first record, uh, this guy Eric Laska, he lived with Christoph that year, or was like I can't remember if they lived together or if they were just like on the same floor, like always hanging out. But um Christoph was like a, a, a year under me, and so was was Eric. And uh we just were like hanging out basically. And I, I think Christoph had like maybe heard the band through Eric at time at, at at that time. And I asked him, and he seemed into it. So, like, I asked if he wanted to, like, play guitar to kind of, like, you know, basically replace Adrian now that he wasn't able to do the band anymore. And he was like, yeah, that's, that's cool. So he replaced Adrian. And then, like, a couple years later, we kind of, like, wanted to expand it and sort of, uh, for the at least the live setup, like, do, like, uh, live drums. Um because people are always complaining that they couldn't hear the drums, and we had no way of like changing the mix because it's just like all one like Nintendo sound file. Oh, um, yeah. 
and that's like the quietest thing in the mix always like for that <laughs> stuff for whatever reason um so we just got uh christoph's brother anton to play drums and like then he joined officially and you know so like the first time those guys were like we we like we like worked on the second album together basically that was uh that's like kind of when they stepped in it was like i guess 2007 or so like beginning of 2008 something like that <laughs> and then oh and then we joined at at the time that those guys were playing that's your the second part of your question was with the pains uh, i was already okay. playing in the pains uh Ooh. and then kip was like we should get a second guitarist for the live stuff mm -hmm. um so he is he, uh, like we you know we were like okay let's just get christoph to do it and christoph was like yeah i'll, I'll do it <laughs> 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 And then, I, then eventually, I left that band, and then Anton was playing mm -hmm. drums. <laughs> so it's like, it's all the same, just same, switching, same yeah. five people I'm just rotating around. It is first there. Oh, thank What's you. What's that? Yeah, I was curious. I was thinking, it's was, uh, really interesting. I was wondering how all of that kind of came about because like these two bands seem very interconnected. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to school with those with those guys, and yeah, it's gonna. They're from LA, but we all we all went to NYU. I'm I'm from New York originally. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I did mention that, but yeah. So they yeah. That's that's where we met. Cool. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we can move on. Do you want to? We can move on to a to the next project of Kurtz, or I guess other music. Dale, you want to talk about mm -hmm. the second track in your playlist? Sure. So. Yeah, so we, I guess, um, well, you joined Pains being pure at heart eventually. I mean, uh, yeah, so sometime around two thousand seven ish, two thousand eight ish. Is this like yeah. prior to the to the de debut album, the self titled um, debut? No, yeah. I, so that uh, that was the first recording I played on. Was that was the album. okay. All right, yeah. so um, the, the song that we're gonna play is uh, "Young Adult Friction." So from from the from from the debut album from the pains of being pure. Ooh. Yes. Right. So get a drink, sit back, get your cat or something. See you guys in a bit. <laughs>
Yes. <laughs> All right. So with the pains, um, uh, you guys were, uh, I guess, been working with some uh, alternative royalties like Alan Mulder and Flood. Like, uh, where, where, uh, 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 how was that like? I mean. Even even on the debut album, it was like Archie Moore of Black Tambourine, and then um, <laughs> Alan <laughs> Mulder, you know, uh, Jesus Mary Chain, Loveless Ride, you know, yeah. uh, Flood, you know, with new who, who worked with New Order, Depeche Mode, Curve. I mean, how was that like? Yeah, that was pretty crazy. I, I mean, the, the first album, to be fair, was uh, uh, our friend Derek. Like, he's just our, yeah. our, our buddy okay, who yeah. like through like fun house parties <laughs> at his like loft and he had like a he had like a, a studio uh mm-hmm. downstairs in his basement um but uh yeah that 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 record was like i think recorded maybe for like a thousand bucks and like <laughs> some beer uh but like uh archie also was so like when we did the first record yeah it was mm-hmm. it was like insane to us that archie was like mm-hmm. available um or like interested in in working on it but yeah he 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 was i i can't remember how that came about actually i don't remember if like kip emailed him or something Uh or like or what it was but or maybe if like mike from slumberland arranged that yeah i I Uh don't remember i think i think at the time i think like there before the record was like fully recorded and and mixed or, or whatever it was like you know we 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 knew uh, that Slumberland was going to be putting it out, so they m- they might have set that up with Archie. But yeah, mm-hmm. that that's kind of how they can't that that can't, maybe came about. I'm not totally sure. Mm-hmm. Sorry, but um, I'm sorry. And and like the second record, uh, Kip Kip was like, you know, obviously like super inspired by Smashing Pumpkins, and, and uh, mm-hmm. was like, well, what if he knew that I I loved Flood like a, as a producer. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what if we, what if we, you know, he was just very ambitious about it. It's like, what if we, what if we got these guys to like work on, on the record? And our, our manager at the time, uh, basically, uh, had managed, uh, Curve. Mm-hmm. So, but like in their later, later years, like, like uh-huh. more like recent albums at the time. Uh, and so he had, he had a relationship with Alan who, who is ma- married to Tony Halliday. So like mm-hmm. he knew, yeah. he knew him already. And like, mm-hmm also had worked with flood because they they work together all the time mm-hmm. so um he kind of it was just fortunate that like he happened to know all those people and like kip wanted <laughs> to make his big like smashing siamese dream album um and That's so like amazing. we were able to do that it, it like basically uh <laughs> i was like bankrupted the, at all the labels and everyone involved but like it was like a very expensive album to make that like i don't know if we, i don't know I, I don't know what was recouped from that but like it was uh wasn't cheap for especially for like 2010 standards whenever you're that's something yeah. mm-hmm. um i think that was like already like sort of the decline for like how much people were willing to spend on making a record so mm-hmm. i i think it was like a, a, like on the on the pricier side for for like the time period um today we would never be able to do that again but it was <laughs> it was a little bit of like you know right place at the right time and just like ha- happen to know some the right people for that one it was it was a pretty mm-hmm. crazy experience um we <laughs> were actually recorded the album too at stratosphere which is a studio that's like not even there anymore but oh, one man. of the owners was like james eha so like he was oh there, wow <laughs> like every day with his cute french bulldog and uh so like we would like walk in and he would be in there with like uh one of the guys from fountains of wayne who like also in the place and then like we would go into the main <laughs> studio and james brown who's like another fantastic engineer was like uh-huh. uh like was engineering the record and flood was producing um and it That's was insane, uh, it's pretty pretty crazy experience mm-hmm. yeah they're they're all like really funny like very like humble guys like they, they're mm-hmm. not like uh it wasn't they made it very comfortable and they were super nice so it was it was mm-hmm. cool i never got to meet alan other than one time like at, at like mm-hmm. a uh it was like um i think it was like his 50th birthday party or something like when we we happened to be there for like 
in, in London when when that was happening. So like we went to that, mm-hmm. but I never got to meet him or really like communicate him communicate with him while he was mixing the record. I, I wish I could have seen what he was doing and like learn some yeah, stuff from him. I think there would, there would have been a lot, a lot of great stuff to learn, but unfortunately <laughs> uh, we just kind of like passed the record off to him and then it came mm-hmm. back sounding like way better. <laughs> We're like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> great job. <laughs> That's great. It's a great story. What, yeah. What, what's the yeah. dynamic like um, writing with, with the paints? Cause I mean, you've had the depreciation guild, I guess on your, uh, portfolio sort of and then you enter yeah. paints as a drummer how was that sort of was it different to the whole process with writing with the depreciation guild or were you kind of yeah well I, it's funny like i think both bands like have a kind of similar structure like where like you know depreciation guild was like you know mostly like my my project where i would like write the song kind of and i would do like the, the programming stuff and then like i would like bring the song in to like band practice and just be like, here's like a new one. Like, and then we would just like work on second guitar parts sometimes. Or if I had an idea ready, I would show the, the part. Like, so for, um, for paints, it was like kind of a similar setup. Like Kip would, he worked like in a uh, logic and he had like this like preset template where he would just use like the, this like funny, like big bombastic drum kit. And he, he'd like program it really shitty. And, uh, he would just like take, I, Oh, also I should preface this with, I lived with Kip for like many years. So, um, like actually going back to one of the original questions, like, how did you join the band? I remember. So like, uh, before I was like officially in the band, we, we became roommates because like my, one of my roommates was moving out and I saw on MySpace that he like last minute needed a place to live. So I like, I was like, Hey, do you want to move in here? And like we'd already known each other, like through our, our respective bands at that point, I think we already maybe played a show together before. And then, and then we lived together. And then he's like, he's like, Hey, he like found out that I played a little bit of drums, which I'm not like really a drummer, but like he he was like, would you want to like play with, with pains just for fun? Like, and we like, <laughs> like a rehearsal and that's how i joined that band it was like it was, it was like for fun at first and they're like oh that was cool like do you want to play with us i was like all right and that was that was basically like how, how i i joined that band um and you're still but, you find uh, yourself in manila <laughs> yeah I, yeah exactly so um but yeah that's so like i lived with kip and like he would he would write songs like in a very similar way where like he would kind of just do these sketches like on on the computer and then in logic and then like he would like <laughs> literally to put it on his like ipod mini <laughs> like he'd take, it, he'd take it he's like okay so here's the demo and he would hold it up to the microphone oh and God. like or, he would, or it was like it was like he would like hold like um uh i can't there was it was like his phone or it was like on his phone or something or like he had something plugged in he would like hold it play it up to the microphone and we would just all be listening on like the pa speakers we'd be like oh okay <laughs> And then we would kind of like do, we would like kind of like workshop like a better version of that with like real uh-huh. instruments, basically. Because uh-huh. like he he's, he plays guitar, but like he doesn't really play bass. So like and, and whatever, it doesn't doesn't it wouldn't really write like you know complicated like keyboard parts or anything. And like so we would just kind of like flesh it out together in rehearsal. So mm-hmm. it was like a, a similar kind of thing, where it's like a song songwriter, and then like you know we would like all like work on it together. Mm-hmm. So and during pains, during I guess your time with pains was, how how was it balancing um, your other projects like you know the depreciation guild was it kind of like sidelined or were you kind of able to do that at the same time as you know I guess touring around with the pains and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like depreciation guild uh, was always like I think a less ambitious project than pains. Like Kip knew like as, that he wanted to like do that full time. And I, it was like, always like a, you know, it would be cool if, but uh, you know, like if we, if we became this like a uh, band that could like play shows and whatever, mm-hmm. but uh, there just wasn't like the same type of like organic um, interest around that band ever really. So like pains after the first record came out, it kind of just like took off and, and I, like none of us really s- expected it to take off in the way that it did. Mm-hmm. Um, like get, getting a good pitchfork review, unfortunately, at, at that time meant a lot. And like, uh, it really allowed the band to just like start touring. So that's kind of like how that happened. Um, 
And uh, so we just started like doing lots of shows. Um, like a lot of opportunities kind of came out of like, you know, that could pitchfork review and like some other, you know, the, the album just being like generally positively re received. Um, so we started touring a lot and um, what was cool about it actually, you know, it wasn't really like a competition with Depreciation Guild because Kip was always like, his whole thing was like, well, let's just do this together. Like Kip, Kip, Kip was always like, I love Depreciation Guild. It's a good, it's like, what can we just do these tours together? And so mm -hmm. that was actually like a really good opportunity for a Depreciation Guild, which was like not a big band ever and like ne was probably never going to tour were it not for pains like just taking the band on the road so um like the first few pains tours even um i think especially the ones where Kristoff, it was like it, it was like financially a really smart move uh to just have have depreciation guild support those tours because we could share the cost of one band and like so there was so much cro crossover in the, the 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 personnel for each band that like we basically it was like it was like it was like a huge cost saver to actually like have the mm. DG be like the support band. So um, you know we that was like actually like a, a cool a cool thing for everyone I think. Yeah, cool. um, and so yeah yeah that was like I think the first two two tours at least there was I th I can think of definitely two tours where like the Appreciation Guild was was the support band, um, mm -hmm. and then because of that you know eventually like depreciation guild kind of like developed i guess enough of a following where we were like we did a bunch of like other support tours i don't think we we all we, we never did like a headline tour maybe one i think we did one in uh we did one in in europe but that was that was basically it but um yeah it, it was it was it was great for that band actually like you know the the, the pain's support was was super helpful and yeah, was it also so during, was it also during this time where, um, I guess uh, I, I'm thinking about how the depreciation guild ended, and I guess the transition into going to yeah. Ice Choir, you know, where is, is this during this time that you're also writing some songs where you think eh, this doesn't fit, you know, this band, so I'm, I'm thinking of you know doing a new one or something like that. Yeah, I, well, okay, so it was like, yeah, it was, it was, um, yeah, towards the end of Depreciation Guild, I was definitely writing some stuff that, like, didn't seem like it totally fit, and I remember playing it for, uh, for the guys in the band, and, like, it just didn't seem like it was, like, their thing, or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and, like, and like it, it just and then I realized I was like I guess this kind of like doesn't really make sense to like play this music for this band, but I want to do it. And then like at the time we had just come off like the last like two tours that Depreciation Guild did was like the one in Europe that we did was um, like the second to last tour, and then the final tour we did was with Film School uh, in the U.S. And like it just didn't seem like there was like like a lot of momentum for the band and we were just like mm -hmm. kind of like getting tired of, of doing it and it was just like and we were also touring with pains all the time so mm -hmm. it was like it was just it just made sense we were we were all just like yeah do we do we really want to like do more tours like this like it didn't we were just kind of tired at that point and um i think like the exhaustion just kind of won out in the end and then i and then like and then uh it was like very like amicable like we were, we're all still friends but like we mm -hmm. just, just stop doing that band and then i eventually started like a new band based around like some of those songs i was working on um because it was it was like that stuff was like a little bit more inspiring at the time for me to write like i i didn't want to do like i didn't want to be beholden to like the sounds that were like inside of the the chiptune stuff i really wanted to do mm -hmm. that kind of like kind of you know sort of like dreamy like music but mm -hmm. i didn't want those like I don't want to be stuck with those Nintendo those, those Nintendo sounds. I was like already like kind of like figuring out a little bit more about like electronic music production, um, and like learning like this is not the easiest way to like make this kind of music. Like I'm just gonna sort of <coughs> teach myself like a new new skill. So I started like you know figuring out Pro Tools and stuff more. Um, mm -hmm. You know 
more seriously. And that kind of like, that's like when I sort of started Ice Choir. Yeah. Um, it- it, yeah. um, it's definitely like a big shift uh, uh, in terms of style and production from from your previous band uh, uh, yeah. going to I Square, where, and I totally love it because uh, especially um, because of you know the eighties feel because I'm a big fan of you know eighties music, especially Prefab Sprout. So first time nice, I heard yeah. I Square, I'm like, wow, this sounds a little bit like like prefab is proud it's amazing so uh, we're a big fan of the 80s or and maybe prefab sprout patty macaloon yeah oh are you are you asking if i am yes yeah. yes if you are yeah 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 that was like you know another uh like kind of like subset of like pop music that i was always really interested in mm-hmm. um and and yeah, I think I yeah, like just uh, as you mentioned, like definitely Prefab Sprout and like Scritty Politi and like Gangway were three like mm-hmm. huge bands. And Sophie Sophie and Peter Johnson was the other one that like really inspired mm-hmm. me to mm-hmm. um, like kind of shift that the sound sort of in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean that's like that's always been my thing. Like as far as like songwriting goes, like I just want I, like it's just fun. I, I'm like a hobbyist songwriter, so it's like. I always just want to like make music that sounds like the stuff that I'm inspired by and listening to at the time, you know, like mm-hmm. it's not really ever like more <laughs> calculated than that. That's, that was like, that was the thing that was like really inspiring to me at the time. Um, so yeah, I, I just, yeah, was kind of interested in like kind of <laughs> copying mm-hmm. that, that shit. <laughs> it's like, that's basically <laughs> it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. I think, yeah, now that we're talking about Ice Choir, I think, what do you think, Dale, we can move on to the yeah. next track off the playlist? Yeah. Sure, and sure. Yeah. We could take a break so, and stuff. Okay. All right. So the next song is from from Afar in 2012. And it's, to me, this feels like the, uh, the really uh, a standout track from, from the album. And it's called Everything is Spoiled by Use. So yeah, uh, pour a drink, get your cat or something, meet you guys <laughs> back here. By the way, Kurt, it's kind of like, I know I only said like oh. until 1, 11, p- 11 a.m. your time. Um, are you still good for like... Yeah. If- oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm totally not doing anything today. So okay. however long you guys want to chat, okay, it's great. cool with me. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So we don't have to worry about time. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got some track from Ice Choir. Get a drink, everyone. See you in a bit. Everything is bored by us and sour 
Tune in to some Ice Choir there. Hello to everyone who's just joined us. I hope you yes, all are we... well. And we have Kurt Feldman here as our guest for today. So, and I heard we have so this... more Ice Choir yeah. in our chat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're trying to get. Pa yeah, Patrick, we're try I'm trying to get him to put his video on. He's shy. Uh, I, I never would. Have... <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is cool. Oh, so yeah. yeah, that that fretless bass there is just really really good. By the way, <laughs> oh yeah, it's it, like icing on the. We got the cake. best in the biz right here. <laughs> yeah. well, I can say, you know, Kurt Kurt comes up with the whole thing, and then I just I have a nice bass, so I get to play it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's not that's not entirely true. Patrick brings his his very well, sp special slippery style to the yeah, equation. Maybe, maybe I'm in, you know, you know when he when when Kurt comes up with stuff, I'll say like, oh, that's cool. But you know, Kurt's like Kurt's a great bass player, better than me. But, uh, it's not that's not true. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, it's listening again, it's pretty loud. The bass, I like that. <laughs> oh yeah. It's like the Kenny G of upright bass, fretless bass. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Kenny G. What do, guys, what do you guys think of that? Because it's kind of a, you know, some people think it's cool. Some some people think it's super uncool, fretless bass. I always thought I, it was cool. Yeah, I, I think it's in, cool. In, it really worked. It really worked on the song. Yeah. It, yeah, it worked. As I said, it's the icing on the '80s cake for this track. So, <laughs> it's yep. perfect. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the music video too. I really, I really love the music video. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah. Sure. that was all Caroline. Caroline, who sang on that song, that yeah. was like she direct directed that video. Art directed. Oh, she did. It, oh, wow. Collected all the props. That's entirely her her thing. That was uh. We just she she did. That was like her idea. She's like, I want to do a video for this song. <laughs> would you would, would, like? Do you want to? To it, here's my idea, and that was like in 100% Caroline, the whole thing. Wow. So, so how did you guys meet Caroline? She, she's uh, from Chairlift, right? Yeah. So, uh, I met Caroline. Um, basically, like, she emailed me. Um, I think before, at some point, like before their second record, and before mm -hmm. the second Depreciation Guild record came out. Um, because she was so her band chairlift which is no longer around um was also on canine records which is like a you know near label um and i think she the way she explained it like how she discovered depreciation guild was like she was on the canine website just clicking around on other bands just be like who are, who are some of these other bands and she heard she heard a, a depreciation guild song or something and it was like I really like the guitar playing on this. I wonder if this guy who did this would 
help record some guitar for our new new record because mm. at the time uh she had just split up with uh she was dating the guitarist for the band and they had just broken up and so they needed uh, some new guitar uh on on the record i think at that yeah i think that was pretty much and then she asked me to like hey would you be interested in like uh you know, like jamming on these songs, like we're, we're really currently like doing our new record. And I, I had already heard of the band at that time. I, in fact, we, Pains, I think maybe played a show with Chairlift at, at one mm -hmm. point, like at Glasslands or something, like like pretty pretty early on. Um, so like I was already familiar with them. But yeah, so I, I went and like, we just recorded some stuff that day. And I think like whatever I recorded, like just jamming with them was the stuff that ended up on, uh, like a couple of the tracks on something it was like uh turning i think was like one of the tracks and like uh, sidewalk? sidewalk safari was the other one. yeah there was like two sidewalk songs safari, that we like yeah. yeah yeah i just like played some guitar stuff on or whatever um yeah that was yeah that was like basically how how i i met those guys and then like years like i, I like two years after that i would say um, I ran into, it was like, I ran into, I think it was like my birthday or something. I was like at, at some bar or whatever, or like walking on the street to a bar. And like, I ran into Caroline and she was like, oh, by the way, this is my boyfriend, George. And I was like a huge violins fan and Lansing Dryden fan at the time. Oh, so violence, I was just yeah. like completely starstruck. I was like, dude, I love your music <laughs> so much. And he's like, oh, cool. He's like, he had, he didn't even know who I was, but like Caroline <laughs> kind of introduced me to him. And so like, that's how, like, like two years later at that point, they were, they were dating. And like, uh, that's like kind of how I sort of met George and that he, and got, he got involved in like the ice choir mm -hmm. stuff, like oh. through that, like just meeting him out that one time. Um, yeah. That, yeah. So that, yeah, that's how we started kind of working together and then mm -hmm. i i played i played guitar in like a couple of other songs for their albums after that too so mm -hmm. so i saw on your um for ice choir i saw on your band camp you did a soundtrack for if i'm not mistaken a mm -hmm. game like game. How, yeah. how did that come about and how was the whole experience like doing music for for a game for, i mean doing soundtrack i mean was this like a yeah. new thing for you or was it like you know um it wasn't totally a new thing i've i've actually done a few game soundtracks but like smaller stuff for um for like ios if if uh, it, uh, it's not it's not like super uh well well advertised i'll i'll link you i can put this uh this other band camp that i have okay oh yeah cuz you uh, you were a producer and stuff i think i saw your um yeah yeah if you're interested in hearing these like uh, earlier like game soundtrack things that I've done, this is uh, I'll, I'll put this in the chat. Um, okay, cool. And so and uh, yeah, so, following that, what why the decision to release it as like I guess you know an entire album yeah. as Ice Choir? Yeah. So okay, well that came about like um, this guy Brandon um sheffield who who's like uh he's like a game writer and a game producer and uh he's like based in um oakland he reached out to me i want to say in like 2013 kind of like after the the first uh ice choir record had come out and uh i think he was just researching he's like oh, i really like this band um he's like i wonder if this guy does game music it's like sounds like kind of like it would be his thing and, and he you know he he just he he basically like looked me up and found out that i had just released that star liquor um soundtrack which was for an iphone game and he was like he told me he's like yeah he's like uh he heard that stuff and he's like he's like wow it would be cool if i, I got this guy to like work on one of my games and he had already put out some games at that point um with like like more like bigger name composers like disaster piece and stuff like had done like a the, one of his games or whatever and so he asked me he's like i'm working on this new game called gunsport and this is like 2013 that, that game took forever to get released because it just had a lot of 
very unfortunate circumstances surrounding like funding and stuff. But he just hit me up and was like, do you want to like work on a game? And I was like, yeah, for sure. And uh, I, yeah, I just started writing some stuff that I thought would kind of work with the, with the theme and sending him over. And yeah, that, that basically just like became the soundtrack. But like, I think from the beginning, he wanted it to be like billed as like I, soundtrack by Ice Choir. And I was fine with uh, kind of releasing it that way. It still sounded like, you know, the kind of songs I would normally do. Um, but with just no no lyrics, I guess. Um, and a little bit more like uh, fast paced for like a sort of game environment. But yeah, that was like, mm-hmm. I, I suppose like it doesn't sound like a typical Ice Choir record, but to me, there's like certain things that are kind of similar to the sounds that I would use <laughs> anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. I saw it and I was like, oh, cool. You yeah. pretty much do stuff all around at this point, you know, <laughs> which is cool. Yeah, I, I so I'm like actually working on another game for him right now, like another okay. soundtrack. Um, I'm not I'm not like allowed to talk about like what the concept is or, <laughs> but it's very different, like the music. Uh, I don't, I might release it as Ice Choir again. I I don't really know. I I, th- I just think it would be cool, like, to just kind of. It's not going to sound like an Ice Choir record at all, but I, I might just I might just do it just because it, it's I don't know fun. Mm-hmm. Well, I wanted to say that I think Kurt has like video game music sort of imp- imprinted in his brain from when he was young. Like it, it's very natural <laughs> for him, I, I think. Yeah, I think it makes sense too with you know starting out with chip tune and you know making music from a thing you used to play games to making music for games. You know, <laughs> it makes yeah. sense in the end. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So yeah. By the um, way, if anyone wants to ask something, say something, see something. Yeah. You know, feel free to unmute yourselves, show yourselves. Oh yeah, I have I a have question. A... Oh sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I I'm Roseanne. Hey. Oh, Roseanne. Hi, Kurt. <laughs> I, yeah, we were chatting uh, <laughs> yeah, on Ro- on Instagram. Roseanne is the reason why this <laughs> happened. <laughs> Roseanne. Yes. Right, yes. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh, You're kind of choppy, Potoruga. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Because, you know, I love the album. Hello. I was just curious about the the inspiration behind this design. And the design. Oh, wait, so I missed which album you're talking about? How far? And designs in red. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so wait, so what? Uh, what, what did you? What? Uh, sorry, I I, I think I may, I may have missed what you what you wanted to know about those those. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just curious. Uh, what was your inspiration behind this design? The the album oh. cover. Oh, the, oh, the album covers. covers. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So. Yeah, Patrick and I have a friend, DV, who does his own very cool music. Um, it's called DBI, if you, you're interested in checking it DBI. out. But he, yeah, he he's like, um, uh, just has a really good design sense. And for both of those records, like, I kind of presented him with, like, an idea, like, a just like a kind of, like, rough, rough concept and some, like, inspirational images of, like, things I think looked cool, like a folder of images basically for both of them. And he just kind of like would just run with it and just come up with something that was really sweet for, for both albums. Um, like the first one, the first album, I knew I wanted to have like a woman's face kind of like in the back, like sort of across the horizon. Um, yeah. But like the way he stylized it was was really cool. Like just kind of creating this like kind of alien uh, world around it, which was like very inspired by um, this Super Nintendo game called Out of This World. I don't know if anyone knows mm-hmm. that one. Uh, or Another World, it was also called that, like in Europe. Um, but yeah, that, that was like two like very in- inspirational images for or concepts for, for that, that first album. And then also this like this other game called Sentinel. 
Um, just like kind of the way that everything is sort of like uh, like low poly kind of that that was like those were like basically the, the inspiration for those. But he the way he stylized and kind of created this like alien world around it was just DV's own special touch. He's very talented. Uh, and then the second one uh, designs that that album cover was like we had the idea of having something like reflecting in a, like a, a puddle of water, or like a pool of water, like the sky or, or something like that. And then just kind of constructing an image around it. And he, we were just through like talking and Patrick, I don't know if you remember, cause Patrick was also jamming on these ideas with, with us. Um, but like we, we were, uh, you know, we, we want there was like certain certain like uh concepts we wanted to sort of like weave weave into it like the album is like mostly about music and like making music and uh like the usefulness of sound and other kind of like there's just like the creative process in general and so like there's the way he sort of did a, a uh he kind of in, he included like elements of like a very abstracted like digital audio workstation and those like kind of like midi squiggles and like kind of squares coming out of the, mm. the puddle is sort of like how we ended up kind of like running with that concept of having something like reflecting or like an emanating out of like a, a, a puddle or like a water source. And then he kind of like, because we, we were also like very inspired by uh, this Japanese artist, Aizen Suzuki, who kind of, who's done like a lot of like the Tatsura Yamashita album covers. I'm sure you guys have seen those around. In like vaporwave circles and like other kind of like internet aesthetics uh, mm -hmm. examples, but like that was like another big touch point for that kind of like doing uh, c constructing a sort of like so yeah it, it's like very like obviously like Jap Japanese kind of architecture inspired mm -hmm. um, like if the I, I don't know if a lot of people have seen the back cover for that um, but there's like a all the song titles like ended up like kind of on a sort of mall. Uh, like a uh, business information mm -hmm. signage kind of like so all the song titles are like a within um, like a a, a mall <laughs> uh, like directory and like each song each song is like a, a different store <laughs> that's what kind of like loosely ties in with the with the song title which was a cool flourish that DB came up with himself so that was uh yeah it's it yeah it's, it's a lot of just like like jamming with DV and like having him run with like his like kind of funny and quirky ideas. Oh, there it is. Yeah. That's the back cover. Some gorgeous accident has it up right now. So. <laughs> Sorry, Patrick was trying to say something in the middle. Go. Yeah. Patrick, you should look if you like, you have to look it up, up close, but all like the little text and little details. It's just a lot of like kind of sort of funny, fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of really like good Easter eggs on there. Yeah, I've, I've been looking at. I was looking at DV's website. A lot of it looks like it came out of like a PlayStation One game, which is cool. Reminds me of you know. Yeah, that's, being a kid. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, when we like discovered DV, like uh, kind of like early on, and I think maybe the first show we played was with DV, right? Is that or second show or something like that? Yeah, the cake shop, the cake shop. Thing. Yeah, cake shop. Yeah, we we like we like looked him up and we're like, oh my god, this guy's artwork is incredible. And he had, he had already released um, like a video for his old band at the time called Konnichiwa, um, and they were like that video was just so cool. Um, and we were we kind of asked him like, you know, would you want to do a music video? And he was he at the time you know was like had just been introduced to the band and was like really into the music so. He said yes, and he actually ended up directing um, one mis music video f on both records. Like he did the Vision of Hell video, cool. and um, he did the Designs and Rhythm uh, music video as well. So that's, cool. that's all. That's all. Him. And he's also done all of our like graphics and T-shirts. So yeah, he's definitely like he's like the the fifth fifth member of the band. Cool. So um. Yeah, uh, I think let's move on to. Um, thank you for the like. It's cool knowing about Ice Choir, but you know you you still got a lot of stuff 
you know, in your, um, I guess, resume or your repertoire. So um, <laughs> I think we can move on to the to the last one we want to talk the, about the last tonight. Track. Um, yeah, this. Cool. Uh, so should we? Yeah, we can listen to it first, and then we can talk about it. Maybe Dale wants to introduce the track sure. first. Okay, so this uh, is a band that happened in between Icequire albums, if I'm not mistaken. Rom- yeah. Romana Clay. And yep. this this is you with Jen and Ryan from A Sunny Day in Glasgow. Yeah. Uh, so this is from the, f- the first and only album, Abandoned Wear, uh, The Prisoner. All right. Cool. So get in more drinks. And let's see you guys in a bit. Yeah. 
That's so nice. Been a while since I heard that track. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of fun memories, though. How did that come yeah. about, though? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, this, yeah. The uh, sunny day. Oh, uh, yeah. Jenner, right, yeah. Well, you know, actually, Patrick it played in the live band when the, for the for the uh, five or six shows that we we. Uh, so I think he's got to come back on video. <laughs> No, nah, I'm just kidding. I'm not, not gonna force him. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, he's uh, uh, yeah. So Patrick did play play bass on in that, in that band as well. So mm -hmm. um, just just goes to show you, further prove my point that we've like basically recycled the same like six people for all the bands that I've ever played in. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, how that came about was mm -hmm. I think Ryan had heard um, Night Squire stuff. Uh, like kind of after like the first album came out, and I I don't remember exactly how we were like introduced. I think he might have just like emailed me and and asked if I if I wanted to like work on some music with them because like at the time I was um, you know still in pains, but like that was like towards the end of like my my involvement in that band um, or at least playing in in the live band. And I was like making myself like kind of more available to do like production stuff um, for for other groups. So uh, I think he just emailed me. But we, we, we found out that we had like a, a couple other friends that we, we knew in common. Like um, I mentioned like this guy, Pete Berkman, originally, um, who I've known forever. He plays plays in that band, Anamanaguchi. And, and he had toured with uh, this other band, Fang Island, which Ryan was playing in um, like as, as the touring bass player so they had met each other and, and we realized we knew like a lot of the same people um and also like paints had played with sunny day in glasgow like mm. uh, like several times especially like early on in the the band's career so you know we we knew uh we, we knew a lot of like the people in the same same circles R ryan was like from philly but had like just moved to new york or i i, I think like so, somewhere around that time so yeah, he, we basically just I think got in touch like over email, and he can, he you know came over to my uh, studio. Like you're looking at my studio, by the way. This is, uh, <laughs> this is like my shitty tiny square. Yeah, um, and it was like probably even less like set up when uh, Ryan tracked that record in my apartment like in in 2013 i think we we started just recording like one one song together i think it was a uh, psp tv i think it was like the, f the first one we did mm -hmm. and then like over time we would just kind of like worked on more songs together until there was eventually like, an album and then um that that was released and and jen was like the other person involved in in the recordings obviously she mm -hmm. you know sang on all that stuff all that was just just done in my apartment so was it this yeah. this was just like a one-off thing or you know is it still out in the open no, if you want to do more stuff a follow-up yeah oh totally yeah i, I i'm I, i'm so happy that uh you know like because that band like played five shows to all, total <laughs> i think like in like the whole it, like like on that first record probably i think there were, we, we played like like five or six six shows i played drums for the for the live band and patrick was, was playing bass obviously but um uh, yeah, Ryan, I know for a fact is working on new stuff because I, I've already uh, spoiler. I've worked on some of it, so and yeah. it's great. Yes. Yeah. So there'll there'll definitely be some uh, some some new Romana Club stuff. Like I, I would say in the next like couple of years, probably. I don't That's know. Crazy. Ryan, Ryan, by the way, is is uh, he passed his his bar exam? He's not. Oh. He's like working. Um, He's 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 gonna become a public defender, which is awesome. Cool. Oh, nice. Um, Congratulations, yeah. Tim. That's nice. awesome. Yeah. So, music for him, like uh, you know, has also always been like a just kind of a fun hobby. But I think it's like definitely uh, even more so now. And like, I I don't know like in what capacity we'll like play shows again, but it would be it would be awesome if eventually it did happen. I don't I don't know. Can't I can't say for sure. But I I know there's some new songs on the way, and, and they're they're very cool. So. It's great, yeah. Because uh, um, uh, it seems to me it was sort of like a, uh, it was like taking a cue from I Squire, you know. It does have that '80s feel as well. Again, some some prefab sprout esque yeah. type of style as well. So 
Ryan is probably the biggest fan of Prefabs Route that I, or one one of like two of my friends that are like mm. the most de- devout uh, Prefab fans. But yeah, Ryan is definitely that's like his right. his favorite band. Yeah, it's it's gonna be exciting then. Um, uh, and aside from from that, I guess soundtrack from I Squire would would there be uh, um any plans for for an album as well? apart from doing soundtracks yeah yeah i mean i'm i'm working on stuff it's like slower than uh when i was like working on the last record um Mm -hmm. i like my my job is uh you know like doing music and sound design for this Mm -hmm. company called listen uh which is based in new york and it's uh you know like kind of doing like a lot of uh sound branding and strategy and mm-hmm. uh sound design for apps and like other um tech companies <laughs> uh so that kind of sucks up a lot of like my ability to uh work in pro tools <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for like x amount of hours during a day uh but uh yeah i mean i i I definitely like after uh, you know we worked on um designs and rhythm i i definitely like kind of like took a break from like songwriting for for a while but i'm like definitely getting back into it again like i i I not not taking a break from songwriting altogether but just more in like a kind of writing pop music for fun context like i i took a break from it but i'm getting back into it i did like another like a uh, pretty different electronic project um, called Tensor Timpani. I, I like just released a track, oh, like one okay. track like a year ago. Um, oh. I have like a collection of songs that uh, I'll probably put out pretty soon um, for that project. It's pretty different. It's like not, it's not, uh, it's not like shoegazy in any way, but um, I'm just, I'm like looking to just kind of like put that out and then, kind of get back in a more serious way to like kind of maybe finishing up like another ice choir record. I, I have like a bunch mm. of like sketches and, and, and concepts that are like to varying degrees of like finished, but um, yeah, I think eventually I'll, I'll release something else. Great. Cool. Great news then. Great news so, for yeah, from, and, yeah. yeah, And apart from, I guess, you know, your more, I guess, commercial or professional sort of audio work, you, we, we will, look forward to more music from you like mm-hmm. yeah yeah cool you you've worked with a number of artists um you know uh Kristen control and i'm like, like you mentioned chairlift living hour which i really love that uh, second album that w- that was really great so um do you have any personal favorites you know work that you that you're really proud of um i mean like yeah like the the romana cleft record I, i'm really proud of i think that that was just like a super fun project to work on just because it was like so exactly like kind of in my wheelhouse of like stuff mm-hmm. I, I, I i like listening to and i just think ryan's just a fantastic songwriter so that was a really fun one mm-hmm. um sa- same thing for like the Kristen control project was actually really great too like that like she's obviously an amazing songwriter um and just like really just open to like any type of collaboration um which i think made it like a lot a lot easier to kind of work on that record because kind of like whatever idea i had she would be like yeah let's let's do it and and it was just Mm -hmm. like you know kind of allowing me to sort of see it out to the end without like you know getting involved in um like it's like shooting down ideas you know like that it was you know so it was it, no, that was like also like really a cool project to do mm. um the living hour album was super fun like i mostly like produced that record and and that we did that in winnipeg um mm. over like the course of like like a week and a half um it was yeah, super wow. It was like brutal studio days just like all all day just tracking so it was like oh, wow. a lot of that a lot of that record was was a lot of um it was a lot of just like kind of time management, you know, cause we had so much stuff we needed to get done. Um, and, and just like, <laughs> uh, 
making sure we were able to like record everything in a week mm-hmm. but it was that was really fun those kids are so sweet and it was <laughs> just like a, a really nice like fun uh vacation for me <laughs> um i would never been to winnipeg before which is, mm-hmm. is a, a really like kind of cool like sleepy city in, in canada <laughs> so it's, it's very nice tell me about it um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, are there any other records you wanna, you know, want to know about? I'm trying to like remember which ones. Are, like, they were all like, I, I never really had any like bad bad experiences. Well, out of curiosity, um, since we had them on the sh- show, you know, a couple of weeks back, how was it? How was you know doing the mix for Tears and Rings? Oh yeah, uh, that was great. That was a super easy project because like, you know it was like all remote and. Mm. Ed was uh, very trusting with just like kind of yeah, just like kind of passed passed me off the files and was like, do your thing. It was like very simple, kind of like very uh, minimal like revisions and and stuff like that. Um, so it was that was that was a, a fun one to do. Just kind of like an easy uh, easy project. But yeah, they're they're great. And Ed obviously has like you know released my music so. Mm-hmm. Uh, very uh thankful to ed and for for all the the stuff that he's put out like a shelf life has just like always been a really cool label to me so cool yeah and he's always just been like a, a champion of like that kind of indie music so yeah for mm-hmm. sure yeah. so um, if anyone else wants to ask something you know we should have a little bit more time this has gone on for a bit too long. I only asked mm-hmm. for an uh, hour from <laughs> Kurt, and here we are, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I um, don't mind. Yeah, I, I I'd mentioned that uh, I heard from a friend that uh, there's a couple of Depreciation Guild vinyl records available from Spindle Hole in Makati. I think that's in Amor Solo in Makati, right? Uh, yeah. So yeah. so if you guys want to check it out, yeah, there's a couple of. Um, I'm not sure which album. I think in her Gentle Jaws, I think was uh, um, it, there's a couple of cup copies available if you guys wanna you know yeah, get it. It's from Spindle Hole Community it's in Makati. I'm not Record sure Shop. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if they're open right now, but they should oh, yeah. mm-hmm. should be able to have one delivered probably. Um, mm-hmm. Let's check it out. It's amazing that you can buy that album there. <laughs> That's, that blows my mind. Uh, there's a lot of um, record collectors in in the Philippines, and sometimes I'm like uh, really uh, impressed that you know records that are really rare are still available in Manila. It's like maybe I should just fly over there, and just, you know, go to a record shop. You know? Yeah, is that like is that like the the reissue of that album, or is that like um, the original? I think it's the reissue. From, oh, from okay, yeah. yeah, it is the reissue though. Wow, cool. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Kim. Hi, Kim. Uh, you said that you're a gamer. Yeah. Am uh-huh. I right? <laughs> What's your favorite game? Um, my favorite series is Dark Souls. I would say. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's that Why? should give you a good idea of like how. Huh? That's like. I'm for real. Um, <laughs> I'm for real. But yeah. <laughs> I was like, I the reason why I like needed like an extra like few minutes this morning was like, I had like just woken up basically because <laughs> I was out playing Ghost of Tsushima until like four o'clock in the morning last night. So, uh, yeah. But you should play that game if you haven't. Uh, it's I'm really. I'm on a Mac, so I can't. I can't. <laughs> Oh, I have I have uh, I have that one for PlayStation Four. I I play all the Dark Souls games on PlayStation, so I, I don't know how everyone else. Is nice. Playing. But yeah, all the Dark Souls games, uh, Bloodborne, Sekiro, like those are like easily my favorite games. And actually, you're not gonna believe who else is like the most insane. Like the guy who got me into that whole series, and like once I like originally rage quit those games, I was like talking to him about. Um, like how like I just didn't understand the game, and he's like, okay, well I, I'll show you some stuff, 
So the, that guy it was Ryan from Ramona Clef. He's actually like he's like the biggest fan of, of like the Dark Souls series and like those kind of like hardcore games. And he's totally the guy that got me into that stuff. So <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone else, you know, anyone else, everyone has, has questions. been quiet the whole night. <laughs> I have a question for Kurt. Uh, yep. Can I can I just say before I ask the question? Can I just say that come Saturday, uh, your performance there is the reason why I want to play the drums, and uh, oh wow, and uh, wow, I just want to say, yeah, I just want to say that. And now that's out of the way, I want to ask uh, if you have any like any like memories in your uh, Manila show with Pains back in like twenty. 12 or, or earlier yeah yeah uh do you guys do you guys have uh, any memories from that manila show um it was funny it's like we, we played like so many shows i when i was um talking with johan uh yeah yesterday about we were like uh, we were just kind of testing out the, the voice chat to make sure i was like not gonna fuck this up today um <laughs> but we, we were like talking about like just shows and stuff in general that like had pains of played and I, I had to like look up what the venue was that we played apparently it was like hard rock cafe makati i think yeah right. and uh yeah i i remember in general like just like small details about uh like kind of like all of the shows we played for that band but like i don't it's weird it's like once you're touring all the time and and that band was touring pretty extensively like a lot of like a lot of the shows sort of like blur together. Um, so like specific details. I remember the Southeast Asia tour that we did that year was really fun. And um, uh, it was just really cool getting to see that part of the world. Uh, but like, it was like a lot of traveling. So I don't really, and not, not a lot of like getting to really intimately see like any specific city. So it was like mostly just like, traveling a lot kind of super early in the morning and then like getting to the venue and setting up and then like having a couple hours to like you know get dinner or something somewhere nearby so like i don't i don't really remember much about it but other than that we had a really fun time and it was like a it was a cool experience Hell were yeah. you at that show oh no i was like 12 at the, i was like 12 I, I, yeah. or 13 at the time so yeah. I know, like, <laughs> most super young here was yeah everybody here was probably way too young to even attend any of those, those shows <laughs> Just really funny to think about. Oh, uh, which I is sad old. because which is sad because uh, Hard Rock is closed. If, uh, <laughs> yeah. If yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, closed. we were trying. <laughs> we were uh, we were trying to like figure out if that was uh, still a venue because we were talking about um, like a lot, like, you know, various venues in in our respective cities that had like kind of come and gone since uh, when we were playing shows. <laughs> And, um, and also, I have a uh, one more question. Uh, what did it feel like for your band to be in the same? Was the debut uh, released under Slumberland, if I'm not mistaken? Was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what did it feel like for your band to be in the same um, catalog as Velocity Girl, Rocket Ship, The Softies? What did what did it feel like for you uh, at the time? Yeah, I mean that was like a really huge thing. I mean, th obviously the the biggest like proponent of like like yes, we we got to like release our, our record on on Slumberland was Kip because like he's just like a massive fan of that stuff. Um like all all those bands that you mentioned, Kip is like a huge fan of. I I I mean, obviously like love Rocket Ship, uh especially that first record and yeah. um it was like really cool in that respect like getting to, you know, you know, be on the same label as them and like stereo lab and uh, oh, uh hell yeah. stereo lab, also, yeah. wasn't um the lilies like they released some stuff on slumberland like yeah there's a lot of like history with that label it's just like very mm -hmm. cool and also like mike was in black tambourine yeah, uh, mike, yeah. So it's mike. like a lot of like you know like kind of like indie pop uh legacy bands if that's a thing um mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it was it was like definitely a really big deal for Kip, and it was it was like very cool to me um, because like at that point I had never even released a record on a label, um, except for the Alps. 
Except for the Alps, right? Yeah, which was I wasn't even on that recording. So yeah, it was on that. We had one song on it, like a very obscure indie pop compilation. Yeah. Uh, can I have a uh, hi, Kurt? Uh, it's game again. Uh, can Can I uh, ask something from you? Uh, yeah. I just have like one tiny request. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna send something to Walkie Talkie. And then, okay. can you read that uh, aloud for me? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Am I going to get canceled for this? No, of course <laughs> this, not. This happens every week. Don't worry about it. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> it happens every week. <laughs> there. So, the if you ever find oh, re- okay, so listens. Is that, you want me to read this out loud? Yes. If you ever find somebody that listens to Kurt Feldman's discography almost obsessively, give that person a hug because the people that relate to that music have been through hell and are probably still there. Hell yeah. I forgot oh, yeah. to warn you about that last night, uh, yesterday. So. I should have told you that was it, coming. It's a surprise. It's great to hear that. It's a surprise for everyone. Wow. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. <laughs> hey, I got some hey. dirt. Oh, hey. yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Maria. Okay. 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 So, like, uh, I just first, I just want to apologize for like heckling you in 2012 <laughs> when you came over. <laughs> <laughs> we probably like, sucked. Uh, I'm sure we deserved it. Ah, uh, because like y- y'all were setting up. And I was in the middle of a crowd right in front of a stage. And then out of nowhere, I just like I said the stupidest thing. I think I said, like, hey, check out his milky white arms. It's like he had a tank top on or something. <laughs> oh, my God. And the room okay. went dead silent. And you, like, uh, took off your headphones, like, what the fuck was that? I, d- I totally don't remember that. <laughs> and, I respect yeah, that, like, though. Uh, yeah, I was at your show, and, like, you signed this for me. You also signed my guitar a while back. Oh, hell yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, like, uh, my question is, like, uh, what do you remember from your Manila show for, from when you came over? Because, like, uh, I remember, like, y'all, like, went, went to, like, a couple of, like, bars before the show. Did I go to that? Was I there, too? I don't, I don't remember doing that, specifically. Okay, it might be the rest of it, man. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's not, yeah, there was like a, a lot of times I wouldn't go drinking on those tours, especially at that time. I think I wasn't even drinking at all. Um, but yeah, like I'm trying to, I don't, there, there's like very few specifics I remember. I remember like the inside of like certain venues and, and stuff, but it's like, it's, it, it's like so much of a blur to me, especially also it was like eight years ago at this point. Um, which is crazy to think about. But yeah, like I, it, I like specific details. I'm like super fuzzy. Unfortunately, I wish I, I wish I had <laughs> more pictures and I remembered more about about those shows. Yeah, but y'all sounded great, and I'm glad you came over. And I hope like uh, the whole world doesn't like uh, die burning, and you could all come back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know, maybe we'll come back like a Payne's reunion tour, like you know. I Ten def- years from now, I definitely would be down for Romana Clef. So, yeah, anyone, yeah. Or, yeah me quite, too. Anyone uh, could come out here. You know, we'll take care of you. <laughs> sure, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. We were we were actually like uh, talking with uh, a promoter who's based in Manila, like uh, a, a couple of years ago. Nothing. It kind of fell through, like with like work schedules and stuff. But like, I don't know. Maybe we'll we'll kind of reapproach the idea when we have some new music to share it would be it would be awesome to to come there especially with with ice choir or you know whoever mm-hmm. cool looking forward to that hopefully let's all hope yeah. the world does not implode in you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um does anyone else have anything because you know it's been maybe it's about time to <laughs> go our own yeah. separate ways <laughs> It's got to be late for you guys over there. <laughs> oh, well, no, believe not. it or not, show's here and at 2 a.m., so it's still quite early. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I guess same here. I have a question again. 
Yes, go yep. ahead. How was it learning about Discord? Like, was it hard for you? Or <laughs> did you have, like, an easy time learning about it? I mean, I've used it a couple times, but, like, very lightly. It's, uh, like, I have some friends that, like have some channels that like we've just used to uh do the the voice chat thing like while we played uh like PUBG or whatever <laughs> like that's what i i've used it like maybe Mom three man. times <laughs> yeah like this was like the last time i used it i think was like probably like 2018 or something but uh oh. it looks a little bit different now and has some more features so yeah there's a lot of like, updates here yeah yeah um Question about uh, uh, what are you listening to these days? Yeah, I mean, I can. Uh, I always do like a every year. I started this a few years ago. It's just like doing a, a, a like a mix of stuff that I, I like. That's you know like contemporary stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll uh, close enough. I usually release it like right at the end of the year. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna make this public and share it with you guys first. All right. Um, but oh. this is a good. This is like a good. Uh, was a good representation of the stuff that I was pretty into this year. Okay, cool. Uh, gonna paste this into the chat and let me know if uh, this works. Do, a lot of people use Spotify over there, or hell yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay, yeah. yeah. I don't know what like the dominant streaming platform is uh, outside of the U.S., but yeah, here everybody's mm -hmm. kind of. We're Spotify. a mini America, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and uh if you're you're if you're interested in hearing um an example of uh my my sound design stuff you can uh mm -hmm. hold down the search button in spotify and like those sounds mm -hmm. that happen i made those cool that was something right. i did for my, my work you've got a playlist here everyone should check out while no one's doing much so um, I think Brutra has a question. Um, yeah. Brutra here. Bruch, walang marinig. Mic test, Bruch. Bruch, wala. You got nothing, man. Oh, it's muted or something? It's, uh, I think it's check your settings. Could be his connection. Mm. Oh, Bruch does not have PT. No one has PTT on. Um, could be the interface. It probably Brucher has an interface on. You can just send the next. Yeah, you can you can type on the language and type on the lang sa walkie talkie. I can. Re I can repeat. Then sa walkie talkie Bruch. Sa left side. Or PM mo kay Rosan. Hang on. I see PLG magazine on your list, by the way. I like, uh, love them too. <laughs> oh yeah, those guys are great. Yeah. Uh -huh. We that was like uh, the last show we played actually, which was a couple of years ago at this point. Unfortunately, mm. was with those guys. So. Yeah. Oh okay. They are awesome. Yeah. Also, it's another another new Slumberland band, carrying yeah, the torch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Those guys are great. It's really interesting you have Machine Girl on here. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, yeah, Machine Girl. Yeah, that uh, that's a a great album overall. I think that's like one of my favorites of theirs. And then the the one from a couple of years ago, also was really cool. Mm -hmm. I see some hum, which is cool. <laughs> Kurt, would you ever be open to like playing like online shows or like playing anything like online music festivals or anything like that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we've never been asked, but yeah, we would, we would do it. I think we'd have a, I think it would probably be pretty easy considering Patrick and I live together and we like, we practice in like this, like, uh, like ever, like every, every practice we've ever done was like, has been in our, our like living room area. <laughs> So we just kind of like set up and practice on headphones there. So we might be easy to 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 do something like that because we could just plug it into the to the the computer. That is so cool. Cool. Um, Crazy that you have eyeliner in your playlist. Yeah. Um, 
<clears throat> that album was was uh, pretty cool. I'm I'm like a big fan of uh, a lot of these are like Orange Milk releases. That's like a mm. a label that like nowadays is really uh, very meaningful to me. Um, it's, I just I think they're releasing a lot of really inspiring stuff. Like the the Lotto Retina track is like another Orange Milk thing. Like the Euglossine stuff is like some of my favorite things like the non-local forecast i don't know if you know angel marklet but she she's doing like really insane kind of cool proggy and uh like like grindcore stuff like non-local forecast is like slightly more more instrumental and like maybe um kind of like 80s prog influence but that's like another thing that's like kind of uh orange milk tangential and same thing with eyeliner um, I'm just going down the list. Like a lot, a lot of this stuff is is from that label, just because like they're just releasing hit after hit. Awesome. Um, yeah, definitely check that, that label. Oh, Shmoo as well. That I feel like if you guys haven't heard his stuff, he is just a really unique songwriter, um, and it's like it's like that album especially um that i the, the track i just put on on that the first one on the list like that's like that album's super shoegazy and and his stuff kind of like always touches on that but it's like it's it's all over the place like just stylistically just really really unique um just textures and and like just like the chords he uses are, are just like very very interesting and he has a record that's coming out on orange milk soon too that's like not shoegaze at all it's just like his insane electronic stuff and I think it might have a track that I worked on with him, uh, but it's uh, it's gonna be an insane album. Um, but check out that that, that album specifically uh, that I put on there. It's, it's just like mostly kind of shoegazy, so I think I think fans of that in this in this Discord would definitely enjoy it. Cool. Okay, we got the question in from Brooch, the one who couldn't get his audio. Oh from. yeah. Um. So he was. He'd just like to say that he's a huge fan of your work, especially with the Depreciation Guild and one of the influences of his band from shifting from the industrial to a more shoegaze sound. His band, who's, yeah. who's bandmates with Rosan GYHT, I would say one of my favorite local bands here, which I could, I'll drop a link shortly. Yeah, yeah, chat. definitely. Um, but so his question was, uh, wait, I, I lost it. Um, how his question was about how you manage setting up your set, li- your live sets, especially when in the depreciation guild, you know, when you were starting out and stuff. Yeah, um, like what, like the first few shows, we were like, oh god, I mean that band, it was usual. Those shows were like, I would say seventy five percent of the time they were like a total mess, and then like twenty five percent of the time it was like passable. And that was always like really like oh the show was like okay that's like <laughs> that was like the best outcome, uh, but yeah like the original shows like were just two guitars, you know going into amps and then we had like our laptop plugged into the PA basically and it was just like I had this like terrible Dell like laptop from college that was like running this like Windows ninety eight tracker, <laughs> and I would have to like load the songs in between each song that we played i'd have to go in and you can't go into a menu i have to type control l and then type the name of the song and if i made a typo uh you couldn't even backspace if you made a typo you it would crash the program and you'd have to reopen it oh, my God. oh shit. so that was that's what i that's like one of my like early memories of like just being so stressed <laughs> out on stage like trying to like get that working and then eventually oh we just switch to like doing like a uh, like a Winamp playlist of like <laughs> of just <songs>. oh, <laughs> yeah. so that was that and then like later on we figured out like there was like this guy selling uh this really obscure cartridge that like could play the Nintendo sound files and that program could export those and you could play it on a Famicom so like uh, we figured it would be like roughly the same, but it would be a cool like you know, like gimmick or whatever like stage thing that just have the the Famicom on stage like playing the sound, 
And we did that for a while, and it there it caused like all sorts of other problems. There was like weird ground hum from because it's like a Nintendo, and it's like using these like shitty components. And um, eventually, we did that for like a year, and then eventually after that, we switched to Ableton, and that was like a huge uh, <laughs> lifesaver. Yeah. It's like yeah, we just we just it like just took a lot of stress off of everyone, and uh, we kind of we kind of switched to Ableton like shortly after um uh like Anton joined the band because it was it was really hard for him to like just play along with the uh Nintendo drums like he was just playing over that stuff and he would just have to just crank the the um the monitor mix like all the way up to the point where like we would like hear it it was just it was it was a mess so like we we switched to Ableton so that we could send him like a click track also another side note of like the the famicom stuff is like it's it's using a clock that's like not like a, a computer clock where it's like set to a bpm it's actually set to a refresh rate for a screen so it's like it skips frames all the time because like it's it not not all like like the way that the the like the nintendo engine works is like you can kind of like choose from different like uh, cycles for like how 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 fast it like cycles through the information that's all synced to a frame, but like a B, like a BPM for a song like doesn't necessarily sync up with those frames basically. So like the net result was that like the ter- it would be tempo fluctuations and like other weird <laughs> shit that was like, really hard to follow. It's like why the drums and like the Nintendo stuff like on on all the the first record especially we 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 like kind of quantized it a little bit in the second album, but. On the first record, we just like spit out the Nintendo data and then like recorded guitars to that, and it's just like it's like everything's a little bit off time and like weird, and it's mm-hmm. it's more noticeable on 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 some songs where like the the refresh rate would would be out of sync more with like like the the sequence elements. So it was just like it was a mess. We switching to Ableton <laughs> was like a big a big thing, we all mostly because we just do the click track. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Richard also wanted to share in the chat. Um, they also started using Winamp, so that's cool. <laughs> Wait, now? Uh, back in 2011, I think. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So like, I was only using Winamp because like that was like the MP3 player that I had like from college, like still on that computer. Yeah. I also dropped that's... a link to their Bandcamp, GYHT, on on the Waffle. Oh yeah, yeah. Show. I'm gonna check this out. So you wanna check it out? Awesome. I love it. We. I, I'd, I'd safe to say all of us here love it. Oh my god! <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm gonna check this out. I gotta open now. <laughs> cool. Yeah. If if anyone has anything else to say, now's your chance. If not, maybe it's time we call it a, a night here, and we let Dale, Kurt, and everyone else get on with their day. Cause. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make breakfast, so uh, but I can still stay here, you know, chat with you guys if you're, you know, if you're here. I think to do on a Saturday morning. Cool. Cool. So, um, anyone else want to profess their love for everything <laughs> that has to do with Kurt? Or um, <laughs> okay. If not, um, it's. Do, do we announce for uh, our guest for next next week? Yeah. Um, if not, I think it's the high time we let everyone go. We'll be here after the last. We'll play one more track, and after that, we'll be here to hang out. If you guys want to still talk some more, if not, you can go ahead with your day, with your evening. So yeah. Um, before we play the last track, I just want to thank Kurt. Dale and I would like to thank Kurt so much yes, for. Thank you extending the one hour i asked for <laughs> into Thank two you. especially Thank you for no it. problem it was, it was my pleasure this is definitely really fun it's been fun yeah <laughs> for cool. sure i hope everyone else had fun too i had a lot mm-hmm. of it's, fun it's re- reaffirming to, to know that like people still uh listen to the stuff i worked on so mm-hmm. thank you for uh <laughs> for being here that's great all right it's cool yeah thank you so um Next week we also have another listening part listening party. We're featuring the band the Estonian the band from Estonia, Pia Fraus. And we will be joined apparently by the entire yes. band. Is that right, Dale? The entire band will um, join us. Yeah, from what I heard, yes. Okay. Uh, so they said they're gonna be they're gonna be online though, the whole band. So Okay. So 
Uh, hopefully, all of them turn up. If not, we will definitely be joined by their guitarist, Rain. Rain, yeah. yeah. Rain should be there, yeah. So it's next week, 11 p.m., same place here. Um, and with that, I hope you all had fun tonight, and I hope to see you again next week. Thank you again so much to Kurt, and Patrick has left, I think. Oh, no, Patrick's still there. Patrick's still like, here. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Popping up, you know, for like... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> So, yeah, we got one more track. Thank you so much. We got one more track um, from the Depreciation Guild. Just to wrap things up, and things on a more, I guess, shoegaze level. Uh, it's the song Crucify You. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Have a good day. And I hope you all stay safe and wear a mask when you all step outside of your homes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Have a Appreciate good one. Appreciate it. All right, see ya. See ya. Oh wait, hang on. This is not the right track. I'm sorry. <laughs> live this version. This is the live version. <laughs> that, that was a fail. Uh, here, I will play a studio version. Have a good day. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Yeah, that was great. Have a good night. Thanks. Thanks again, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>